Hello, and welcome to another Science of Elite video. Today I will be speaking about gravity and how it shapes the environment inside stellar systems. In game, we spend a lot of time flying between stars and planets. Our planetary system contains a lot of information, so from a purely academic standpoint, what does most of it mean? Like my last video, I'll hit you up with a quick equation and build up from there. You might have already guessed it, but let's get stuck in. This is Newtonian's classical gravitational force equation. It gives us force in newtons between two objects of mass m and m, separated by distance r. To fair accuracy, it appears to be correct, and we don't have to invoke general relativity unless we go to some pretty extreme circumstances. So, for now, we'll assume this is good. This formula is the basis of what defines things like the length of a year on an alien world, surface gravity, and some other interesting things, such as the minimum distance at which an object can orbit. With the time-lapse videos that I've been playing, I hope I've been able to demonstrate that everything in Elite is moving. Everything. Even if we cannot immediately perceive it. So, the first subject I'll talk about is the answer to a question which comes up fairly often in the community, and that is, you're flying around and you find a giant ice planet. You look at it and you say, wait, it has 19 Earth masses, but why only 1.2 g? We tackle this by considering the equation for a test mass sat on a surface of a larger spherical mass. We bring in our gravitational force equation and Newton's second law of motion, that the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Now if we equate these two, you'll end up with the acceleration on one side and g m over r squared on the other. Acceleration here is actually g, or the acceleration due to gravity. Now you see the reason why the planet has only got 2g, because of its enormous radius. Easy, right? This brings me on to the next topic in relation, that is, density. Each planet type has a different mean density, and it is this for a given radius that defines just how massive and how high the surface gravity thus is. Here I show a histogram from the EDDB of the density distribution for different planet types. What you see is from low density to high density, we go through icy planets through to metal rich. All this makes logical sense. An icy planet is composed mostly of frozen volatiles and rock, and thus the mean density should be fairly low. We then jump up to rocky with an intermediate type of rocky icy. What we see here as well is that the high metal content world it spans a wide range between rocky and metal rich, with Earth-like planets appearing to be a subclass of this. This plot shows the density distribution for gas giants, and you see that despite the gas giant being quite massive, it is, in general, quite low mean density. All this plays a very important role when we move on to our next topic, which is orbits. Now, what I'm going to show you is a general diagram. You might be thinking of an orbit as a central body with smaller masses orbiting around it. While in most cases that's fine, it isn't really the truth, however. The real situation is shown in this diagram. In order for a pair of bodies to remain in orbit, something has to prevent the acceleration of the bodies together and that is the tangential velocity. The tangential or forward velocity of an object remains constant, and the acceleration due to gravity drags it around in a circular path. For the case of a circular orbit, a system will rotate around a center of mass of a system. Thus, when you look at a stellar system with a binary star pair, they are not both orbiting nothing. They are actually locked orbiting the center of mass. For a typical gas giant plus its moons, for example, the center of mass is typically quite close to the gas giant's center of mass, and such concentric rings example is a popular way of showing this, although a misconception. One of the most misunderstood concepts used by people to claim that Frontier Stellar Forge is getting things wrong is that of the Roche limit, or Roche limit. But what is that? Well, the so-called Roche limit is a virtual line in which an object on the surface of one object, say, our moon, is equally attracted to the moon as it is to the Earth. The consequence of this is that no objects may coalesce to form a moon or a planet closer than this line. Anything that moves inside this line is also under great tidal stress and should break apart, technically. Once more, this limit can be calculated by applying the Newtonian force equation. Fg here is the attraction between the object U and the planet itself. So, what about the attraction towards the primary object? Well, this is the tidal force, Ft, and it is the difference between the primary object's pull on the centre of the secondary and on the closest surface. At this point, you look at the last equation and go, wow, 
that looks like a mess. But, thanks to some maths, if the radius of the primary is much larger than the secondary, and the separation greater than the primary radius, the square terms tend to zero. Thus, we get this much nicer looking formula for the tidal force. Great, now let's get a new page and redraw our diagram and write out all of our formulas. We now set Ft and Fg to equal to each other and solve for d. This result, however, is a little bit problematic. We'd rather not require the secondary object's radius in the formula. Luckily, however, we can do a trick by substituting the mass of each object for the following equation relating the radius and density. And once again, everything cancels out and we get our final equation. D equals 1.26 times the radius times the cube root of the ratio of the density. This formula is widely misquoted as the Roche limit is 1.25 times the radius. The assumption being that the density ratio of the planets is equal to 1. And this obviously is not the full picture. Not only that, but the truth is a bit more complex on top, as so often is. And that is because, one, the objects do not need to be rigid, and two, objects rotate. So, let's label our first equation the solid Roche limit, and if we consider the secondary object as a fluid, we can do lots more maths, some fluid dynamics and some physics, and get the last equation. This I will call the liquid Roche limit, and I'm not going to derive this. The important part of this, however, is that in reality, the limit is somewhere between these two points and gives us a look into just how much tidal stress a planet is under. One of the most famous planets everyone cites as an example of the Roche limit at work is Saturn, and significantly, its beautiful ring system. Let's draw Saturn to scale along with its rings as a solid circle. It is often said that the rings represent where the Roche limit lies. And this is sort of true in a hand wavy kind of way, that is true for a low density object. So, first, Let's look at a real object, Pan. This object orbits here. Its radius and density are quite low, lower than the average ice world in Elite. If we run the numbers for the density of Pan, we can draw the solid and liquid limits for this object, and we see that Pan is firmly inside the liquid Roche limit, but outside the solid. This shows that for small low density objects, they may form inside the liquid limit although are likely prevented from growing too large and undergo a good amount of thermal heating from tidal stress. Pan accretes material from the ring and as such is not spherical at all. If we assume the outer ring is the liquid limit and calculate the density, we produce a value of approximately 800 kg per cubic meter. We can feed this number into the solid limit equation and it might not be too much of a surprise, but we actually get the distance that corresponds to the innermost major ring. This density also points to Saturn rings being mostly made of ice. Now, if we plot the lines for Elite Dangerous's lowest density moons, icy moons, we find that if an icy moon formed and was able to decay in its orbit, it could exist quite well closer to an object like Saturn. The amount of tidal stress and volcanic activity on such an object would be rather high, but it would not be impossible so long as the density was high enough. This is why the limit is not as simple as people often think. On this, Let's look at this example. Here you see a time-lapse video of a planet and its moon from the surface of the moon. Firstly, you can see that it is tidally locked. That is, it orbits once around itself for every orbit around its planet. Like our moon, it is always facing the host. Secondly, you can see that it is very close. So once again, I'll draw it to scale. Here we have our distances and dimensions and it is typical of an object that many people declare to be impossible. Now, knowing what we saw before, I will put some of more lines on the diagram. The red region is the distance excluded by the liquid limit. Our moon is placed just within that limit. Its closest surface also remains outside the solid limit. In truth, it is the center of the separation that is the most important, and I point this out to say the following. This configuration is absolutely fine, and what you would expect on the moon and quite possibly the primary planet, is a high level of volcanic activity driven by the tidal stress. And this is exactly what we see in game. Frontier got this right, it would appear. There are obviously some outliers, such as Mitter and Halo, and that is definitely a no-no. And there's some other close past highly eccentric planets that skim the surface of other objects, or are extremely close to white dwarfs, but these are probably representative of transient states. 
that would result in an eventual destruction of the planet more than actually being impossible. The Stellar Forge most likely took a snapshot of these systems based upon the age of the system, and if the planets were evolved from that point, we would probably go to a point of annihilation, and so what we actually get are these transient states frozen in time. My final note here is to show you this plot. It shows you the EDDB data for radius against mass for regular planet types. You see obvious bands of different planet types and some interesting regions that might indicate there are several subclasses of each class. If we zoom in, however, to the smallest planets, you see there are no planets below about 120 kilometers in radius. Uh, what does this mean? It is likely a hard cutoff and there could be subclasses of objects that are not as yet modeled in the game, or at least not visible. These objects would be highly irregular and more potato-like than the most potato-like worlds currently in game. So, what is this? Is this a sign of the future? Right now, we know that comets were in the Stellar Forge, although are deactivated and not rendered in game. Are other such small objects in game as well, as obvious additions in future updates? This I have no idea of knowing, but I certainly hope that they appear in the future. This brings me to the end of this video. I hope it's been quite informative and enjoyable, and I will continue with more Science of Elite videos in the future.